Aren't you thankful for that grace? Amen. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. While you're turning there, let me just say I have a thank you card from Brother Dennis and his family for your prayers and thoughts and flowers on behalf of the church. So uh, we'll put it up on the bulletin. But thank you once again for supporting them. I encourage you to keep doing that in the days ahead. Luke chapter 16. Now don't panic, but I'm going to read a different version of Scripture than what you probably have, okay? I'm going to read from the English Standard Version this account. Not the King James, but you'll be able to follow along, I promise. There's a couple of words in there I want to make sure you understand, so that's why I'm going to read this account. Luke chapter 16. And he, being Jesus, said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called to him and said, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, so you can do no longer or no longer be a manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from the management or stewardship, people may receive unto me their houses. Verse 5 is where I'm at now. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Basically, he cut it in half. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, I owe a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, Take your bill, write eighty. I think I'd rather been the first guy. That's okay. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it, it fails, then you may, be, may receive unto you the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you their true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own. No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he would be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We have been talking about getting fit in many different ways of our life, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. This morning I want to bring this text to you, getting fit financially as well. The last two verses are the two verses obviously we will concentrate on. If you didn't know it, in Scripture there are over 2,300 references that deal with money or possessions. In fact, Jesus spoke about this particular subject more than any other subject that He spoke on. Why is that true? Why would Jesus address those things? I think that's true because there are both practical and spiritual principles that all Christians need to be understanding and applying in their life. There's not just the spiritual side of it, but there's a practical side to it as well. So let's just kind of look at some reasons Jesus would teach, or Jesus would be interested in this thought of possessions or management or stewardship of what we have in our life, the resources that He has blessed us with. First of all, there's some spiritual reasons. One... How we handle our money has a significant impact on the relationship, the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Go back into the text that I read to you in verse 11, especially there. If therefore, I'm back in the King James Version, if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, uh, to your trust, the true riches? Obviously, he's trying to make a point there. If you're careless with the things that are earthly, you will be careless with the things that are spiritual or eternal. What are those eternal things? Those things that are not of this world. True riches. Well, that's obviously the Gospel. Salvation. Faith. Hope. All those things that Christ gives us. The true riches of life. If you are not faithful in the things that are earthly, you will not be faithful in those things that are eternal. Be very careful. One of those things that are eternal is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if you're not going to be faithful in the things that you can handle, those things you can put your hands on, those things that you manage 
physically, you'll never be able to manage those things spiritually that Christ can give you as well. So there's a real key relationship there. A lot of people say, Brother Mark, uh, I, don't, I, don't under, I don't see that. What's mine is mine and what's the Lord is the Lord's. Keep that thought in mind for a minute because I'm going to help you with that one, okay? Uh, I had a young man who went to uh, school with me and, uh, at Welch College. <clears throat> and he's, he was a pastor. and He said, you know, uh, I, give, I give five days a week to the school and I give one day a week as mine Saturday and one day a week to the Lord. And I always let that play through my mind. And I thought, no, I don't think you've got the right concept here yet, son. That's not the way it works in life. Christ is trying to make it very clear as He's he teaching through this parable. Listen, if you can't be faithful in the things that are of this world, you'll never be faithful in the things of true riches. Let me take you to a second point. I'm reading from the text here, so stay with me. Money is the primary competitor with Christ for the Lordship of our lives. Look at verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. Notice the phrase in there. You cannot. Is that what the word says? Ye cannot serve God and money. Riches. That's what he's talking about. You cannot. Listen, we want to have it both ways. God and Christ teaches very clearly here, you can't have it both ways. You can't love the things of this world, especially riches of this world, and love God too. You cannot do that. I know it's getting personal here, and I, wasn't, I didn't think I'd get a lot of amens this morning, but stay with me for a minute. You cannot do that. There's no possible way that you can love both things. Now, let me say this. Well, Brother Mark, I can love God a little and love money. I mean, I can God love God a lot and money a little, can't I? No, you can't do that. Let's just suppose when I was proposing to my wife, I said, now Debbie, I love you a lot. But I love, and put any other name you want in there, it wouldn't matter, I love her a little. How do you think that proposal would have went? <laughs> it, it would have been a flat no. But don't we do that with God? We say, God, listen, I love you a lot. Oh, how I love Jesus. I just love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And then we say, but Lord, now I love this a little. Can I love it a little? God's saying you can't do that. You cannot do that. You either love me or you love it, riches, material possessions, you love it, but you can't love both. You cannot do it. That's a pretty stiff standard, isn't it? Why would He have such a high standard? Why would God have such a high standard? There's some practical things. Let's move on just for a minute. I think God puts a plan or He gives it to us in Scripture, especially for handling our finances, so that they do not handle us. Very practical reason that's there. God gives us a plan or a way that we should teach our children, the way that we should give, the way should we invest, the way we should save, the way we get out of debt. All of those things, God teaches those in Scripture. And listen to me, they're very practical as well. There are some spiritual things that are there. But there are some practical things that are there as well. He said, this is a, listen, this is a good way to do this. This is the proper way to do this. This is the right way to do this. It is for your benefit. I, I, I read an a article the other day when people were talking about the reason that the law of God is there, the guidelines of, of God's law is there. And he said, you've got to kind of see the, the guidelines of the law and what Christ has taught us here, not as a not as a roadblock, but as a guardrail. A lot of times when we read something like that, we see a very hard account of what Christ has demanded in our life. We look at it as this thing where it's stopping me. I can't enjoy doing what I want to do, or I can't live my life the way that I want to, when really what that law is, is a guardrail trying to keep us from killing ourselves. 
harming ourselves, endangering our life. That's exactly what the law of God is there. It's saving us, keeping us, protecting us, not stopping us. So God puts His standard there, what God wants in our life, not, not, listen, not for His benefit, but for ours. So that these things will not control us. So that these things will not consume our life. Use the economic term. So there's a very practical reason. Let me give you the second practical reason there. Most of the time, our plans don't agree with God's plans. Now, I know everyone in this room, most of y'all probably with somewhere in the back of your mind, you probably thought it was God's will for you to win the lottery about two weeks ago. Right? Because you knew what you'd do with it. So you just kind of in the back of your mind, you just thought, I know, I don't, don't raise your hand, who bought a ticket? I don't want to know. Okay? But somewhere in the back of your mind, that's not God's plan. Most of the time, our plans for what we want to do and how we want to do it do not align with God's plans. So God gives us a very practical reason. You know, and you know what happens with our plans. They get us in trouble. <laughs> God's plans will never do that. I've never heard a person say yet, I did it God's way, and boy, I'm sure sorry. I did it God's way, and boy, it messed up my life. I did it God's way and it caused financial ruin because I did it God's way. I did it God's way and I have suffered forever because I did it the way God wanted me to do it. Never heard that yet. But I sure have heard it when I've done it my way. <laughs> and you've heard it when you've done it your way. But you never heard it when you've done it God's way. So there's some practical things here as well. Let's get into that. First of all, let me say this. Our perspective should be... Well, let me say this. God's perspective should be our perspective. The way God thinks should be the way we think. So how does God think? If we should think the way God thinks about our resources, our time, our money management... If we should think about those things the way God thinks, how does God think? First of all, let me say this. God owns everything. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's and all, isn't that good? And all that is there in it. I'm back in the ESV for a minute. Everything is God's. You know why I like the ESV version of that? Because it's got the word all in it. Guess what all means? Amen. There's nothing there that's not God's. Not one thing that's not God's. You see, realizing that truth is a first step, step into commitment, I think, contentment with God. God owns everything, so I don't have to worry. God owns everything, so I don't have to be concerned. It's God's. God will take care of it. God will supply the needs. God will provide. God will do all those things. Why? Because it's God's. You see, when it's mine, I worry about it. When it's mine, I'm concerned about it. When it's mine, I want to protect it. When it's mine, I'm concerned about whether it's going to grow or get more or less. I'm worried about all those things. But when it's God, I don't have to worry. Because I know God can handle His. You see, to be genuine followers of Jesus Christ, Listen to me. We must learn to transfer the ownership of everything we have to God. That's what discipleship is all about. Are you, do you still have your Bibles there in Luke? Go back to chapter 14, verse 33 with me just for a minute. I want to read you a verse. I told you he spoke about this a lot. But in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, this thing about discipleship, he says this, So likewise, whosoever... He be of you that forsaketh not all, there's that word again, all that he hath cannot be my disciple. And let me remind you of something. The word disciple in Scripture and Christian are the exact same words. Not two different levels of Christianity, the same thing. So likewise, whoever cannot forsake, who does not transfer ownership of everything in his life, to me, be a 
Christian. Not just a disciple. Don't mess that term up in your head. Disciple, Christian, same word. Look it up. Same word. So I must transfer everything that I have to God. Now, here's, stay with me for a minute. Remember who you're giving it to. When you transfer everything you have, remember who's owning it at this point. It's God. The One who can take care of it. The One who can provide for it. The One who can bless it. The One who... That's who you're giving it to. Let me take you one more step for a minute. God owns everything. Now I'm talking about His perspective. God controls everything. You you remember the story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar? When Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar what was going to happen to him, Nebuchadnezzar was prideful. He said, that ain't going to happen to me. And God said, watch this. He turned him into an animal. Remember that? Man, it would look like grew, grew talons and feathers. Went crazy. God humbled that man in a heartbeat. You know what Nebuchadnezzar said after he came back to his mind and God restored him back to human form? You know what he said? He said, here's what he said. Listen to me. He said, nobody can stop the hand of God. One of the most powerful kings on the face of the earth at the time, he said, nobody can stop the hand of God. God told me what was going to happen and guess what? It did. I believe Him. I don't know where God's got to get you, but listen to me. God controls it all. But here's the good part. Stay with me. You know the verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. God works all things together for our good. That means He controls everything and puts it in place for our good. When does that happen? When I transfer everything to God. It doesn't happen until I, I, I give Him ownership of everything. God can't use it for my good. God can't make it for my good until I first transfer everything to Him. But when, he, when I do, guess what happens? God uses all those things for my good. Yeah. Y'all know what a financial planner is? That's them people you go to and you say, tell me how to make more money. <laughs> tell me how I can retire at 55. You know them guys? Think about it. If you want the best financial planner there is in the world, that's God. When you transfer everything over to Him, what God can do with it because God is in control of everything. It's amazing what God can do. The third thing about His perspective is this. God provides or His provision. Remember the text in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We quoted it. Remember this morning? God will supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. God can and will meet our needs. God can. Why? Because God's in control of everything. And when I transfer everything over to Him, guess what God's going to do? He's going to multiply it and He's going to provide for every need that I have in my life. Listen to me. God is predictable. My wife, the other day, she said, I'm tired of looking at the stock market. That's where she made retirement stuff here. She said, I'm just losing money every day. I said, you can't tell what it's going to do. It goes up one day, down the next, up one day, down the next, up one day, down the next. It's unpredictable. Guess what? God is predictable. God is always faithful. God always provides. God always blesses. When does He do that? When I transfer everything over to Him. When He is in control of everything. We're unpredictable. He is predictable. We may not know how He will provide, but God will provide. You can't predict how He's going to do it, but He will. Let me say this, folks. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. You see, when you limit God, you forget who He is. You forget that He owns everything. You forget that He's in control of everything. You forget He's the provider of everything. Don't limit God. So, that's God's perspective. What should be mine? What's my part in all this? (laughs) You like the part about God, you're not going to like this part. You see, the concept of biblical stewardship is found everywhere in Scripture. The very idea that man is a steward of God and all of His creation and the life that God has given him 
is very clear from the beginning of the creation story. Go back and read it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. God gives the responsibility of stewardship over His creation to man. The reality is that there was no aspect of creation that Adam could claim. God had created everything. God was the complete owner of all of creation, but He gave Adam the responsibility of being a steward of it. God brought the universe into existence. We know that. Genesis 1.1 For God created the heavens and the earth. He sustains that. Oh, sometimes read Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. All things consist by Him. By Christ. By God. So if He created it all, and He sustains it all, listen to me, He is in sovereign control of it all. Now stay with me, because I'm going to take you on a journey just for a minute, so don't lose me for a minute. The biblical concept of, 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 of stewardship is rooted in something, you've got to go back into the Old Testament, of slavery. Now stay with me for a minute. The biblical, historical, biblical concept of slavery is different than what our historical concept is. And let me show you what I'm talking about. In Old Testament history, the owner of a slave would give that slave the administrative responsibilities of his entire household. That would include responsibilities to the children of the, of the home, other people in the home, as well, as well as financial decisions. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go back in your mind to the account of Joseph. When Joseph entered Potiphar's house, Go back and look at the text of how Joseph was entered, uh, entered into that relationship with Potiphar. It wasn't a paid position. Stay with me. Joseph was considered a slave. Joseph became the overseer of the steward of the entire household of Potiphar. Listen to me. Nothing that Joseph had control over or was accountable for, belonged to him. It all belonged to Potiphar. Two things I want you to get out of this. Listen to me. Joseph was accountable. He owned nothing, yet he was accountable for what? Everything. That's the principle I want you to get in your head. Joseph owned nothing. Yet he was accountable for everything. We, listen to me, we own nothing. We are stewards. But we are accountable for everything, listen to me, in our world and our life. When I say our world, I'm not looking at the globe, folks. I'm talking about the world you live in. Your family. Your church. The community. You are accountable for your world and your life. You don't own it, but you are accountable for it. Now, you say, Brother Mark, I don't think I like that. Go back to my first step. God's perspective versus mine. Keep that in your mind as we go through this. I want you to understand another point. Stay with me. The biblical concept of stewardship often focuses on financial concerns, supporting the church, or some parachurch ministry. That narrow focus does not, I think, allow for the proper Christian worldview of biblical stewardship. The, script, the Scriptures teach stewardship of our time, our energy, our resources, our talents, and even our care for the environment. So don't just say, when I say stewardship, you're saying, Brother Mark, you're talking about what I give to the church. No. I'm talking about your life, your energy, your time, your talent, all the things that you are involved in in your world. All of that you are responsible for to God. You don't own it, but you're accountable for it. That's what God has put into your life. So think about that for a minute. Don't narrowly focus your mind 
on what 10% is. Or what gift you give to the church. That's not what I'm talking about. It's included in it, but it's not what I'm talking about this morning. You are a steward over everything God has given you. And listen to remind you, listen to me, all good gifts come from God. Next little step. Stay with me for a minute. If you look at the original word for steward, it's the word where we get our word economy from. If you know anything about economics, I'll give you a little lesson, Brother Lee can help me here. Economics means the management of of a household or the management of an, of a, an environment. You see, that word economy implies much more than just a financial responsibility, but anything that would involve managing that company or that household. If you're the manager or, uh, or the economist, what you're looking at is a bigger picture. You're not looking at one segment. You're looking at the big picture. And what God's trying to get us to understand is don't focus on one, even though that's important. Look at the bigger picture. It involves everything that's going on in your life. Not just your money. But everything that happens in your life. Your time, your talent, all of those things. Uh, Let me take you down a a, a phrase that... uh, or put a couple of words here in your mind just for a minute. Put these words in your mind when I'm talking about stewardship, the Christian stewardship. Number one, and I think Christ teaches this very clearly, number one, it's investment. Think about that word, write it down for a minute. The word investment. God calls for us to invest our personal time, our abilities, and our finances for the benefit of other people, all the time we're being held responsible. I don't have time to read it. Jot this text down. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Christ talks about investing. A lot of times when we look at what we do, especially when it comes to church, we say, we want you to give. I want you to understand, you are giving, but it's an investment. Remember what Christ said, don't lay up treasures on this earth, but lay them up where? In heaven. You know what He's talking about? Investing. Every one of you sitting here this morning are the product of an investment. Did you know that? Somebody invested in your life. Somebody took the time, the energy, the effort to invest in your life. And because of that, you're a part of the kingdom of God. Somebody studied. Somebody gave. Somebody took the time to witness to you. Somebody got, took enough gumption to get you up, get you to church, bring you here so that you would hear the Gospel. It is an investment somebody made in your life. And I guarantee you, you ask that person, Sunday school teacher, pastor, youth pastor, mom, dad, whatever you want to, seeing you sit in a worship service on a Sunday morning, they're saying, my investment was worth it. Giving of my time, my talent, my energy, my resources, my money is an investment that I'm giving. And it is the greatest investment you will ever make. Keep that in mind. It is an investment. One of the greatest things that we have that God has entrusted us with is the Gospel. And I'm not talking about just church leaders and apostles, but I'm telling you, by the grace of God, He has invested in us, He has given to us that great gift of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are accountable for that Gospel. How we share it, when we share it, what we do with our time, talent, and resources to make sure that Gospel is carried out, we are stewards of that Gospel. Notice in Matthew chapter 25, he says, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. He's talking about you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a steward of that gospel and you are accountable to God for that. The third thing, let me say this. You are accountable for sharing your life. Why? 
Because that is a sign of being in Christ. Go back and read the accounts of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 as the believers began to gather together. And you notice there it says they began to break bread in one another's home. And they began to sell their possessions and give to those that were in need. And they began to uh, rejoice with one another. God, folks, I want you to understand something. They were sharing their life with one another. It wasn't an hour on Sunday. It wasn't an hour on Wednesday night. God said, share your life. That is the mission of the church. That is the mission of the Gospel. Share your life. That's played out in Acts chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. As Paul said, the churches gave to one another as they were in need. Folks, it's it's not just about money. It's sharing your life. God has given you life, abundant life, eternal life. It is an investment He has made in you and He said, share it. Give to others. Now, here's the crazy point. Stay with me just for a minute. I know biblical stewardship flies in the face of what's going on secularly in our world today. There's a viewpoint out there that says that if you don't own it, you won't take care of it. But I'm convinced that being a steward, biblical steward, should increase our care and diligence instead of making it less. Why? Listen to me. Because everything we have been given will be taken back by God one day. Think about it. Our life will come back to God. As the old saying is, you ain't going to take it with you. Everything is going to go back to God one day. And God will hold us responsible for what we do with it. Our everyday stewardship, listen to me, I'm talking about maintaining your home, maintaining your vehicle, going to work. All of those things links us with God. Because He maintains the world. Stay with me for a minute. Because I'm convinced that God does just not want an intact creation when it comes back to Him. He wants a return on His investment. So what God has given us, He doesn't want you. Go back to the parable that He said, of the one who buried that one talent and said, here it is. He was judged because of that. He just gave back what He had been given. No, God said, no, 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 no. I'm giving you and I expect more in return. Do something with your life. Invest your life. It is tragic. Listen to me. It is tragic that Christian stewardship has been reduced to tithing. Is it included? Yes. But that's not what all it is. Since everything belongs to God, we should give generously and disperse things to help others as well. Why do we do that? 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, because we have been given to, we give. It is a spontaneous overflow of gratitude for what God has done in our life. We can't help but give of our life. So stewardship is something that every person, especially Christians, should be concerned with. The accountability that we have to God for every area of our life is clearly seen in Scripture. That includes the way we make, use, and consume the money we have, the time we have, the talent we have, and the resources that we have. You see, the reason I give is because God gave to me. And listen to me just for a minute. The greatest investment you will ever make is to give your life to Jesus Christ. Transfer everything you own to Him. When you do that, not because I'm promising you this, but because Scripture says, when you transfer everything you have to Him, God then is in control. God then can bless God then can provide. God then can protect. We own nothing. But we are accountable for everything. Have you given 
it all to God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. Lord, you've given us so much. (laughs) What an investment you made in our life by giving your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross. The greatest gift, the greatest investment, the greatest wealth ever known to man, the life of the only begotten Son of God was given and invested in my life. And God, all that You ask is that I give it back to You. And when I do, Lord, You said that You will provide and protect and bless and secure and control And the worry, concern is gone. Because my treasure is not here in this world, it's in heaven. Lord, I pray if there be anyone here today who has never made that great investment of surrendering their life, transferring everything that they have to You, that today would be the day that they trust You as the Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, my greatest fear, there are Christians that are here who are trying to love You and love something else. (laughs) They've never given everything to You because they love You. They're holding back. There's something else or something else or someone else that they love. God, I pray today for that Christian who's holding on that they would surrender it all to You. Invest their entire life in You. God, speak to us today. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Brother Phil's going to lead us a verse of invitation. Maybe you just like to come and pray. To say, Lord, it's Yours. It's all Yours. If you'd like to do that this morning, these altars are open. Won't you come as we sing together? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have That's riches untold. I'd rather have it's all Jesus yours, right? Than houses or lands I'd rather be led By His name My time, my talent, hand, my money Than to be the king Of a vast domain Or be head in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than...